All right, we're all set. Please go ahead. Okay, the, we're uh, adjourning. Not adjourning. <laughs> we're calling uh, the uh, Finance Committee, Committee meeting to order uh, on Tuesday, October 1st at p.m. Uh, this is a um, Zoom only meeting. Um, and we have uh, a lot of members of the public may uh, attend virtually via Zoom or by phone. Um, and there's a number on the um, on the agenda for those of you who wish to uh, participate that way. Um, I just in order to make sure everyone can hear me, everyone, I just want to go around the group um, and just check out uh, Bernie. I'm here. Uh, Councilor Haneke. Present. Andy. Present. Kathy. You're on mute. Here. Tom. Here. Okay. And uh, as I, I said, um, uh, Alicia has uh, said that she's started a, a grad. She's so she has a conflict. Uh, she can't meet before three thirty days. So um, when we get to the uh, finished, the rest of the business we'll go through um, and uh, the agenda, and if we can uh, start polling for uh, another um, alternative. anyone um oh, in, bob matt matt just joined can we confirm he can hear and be heard please hey bob how you doing hey matt yes good okay so um we're going to start with uh public comment there are six people in the audience does anyone wish to um comment on the um They don't have to focus on the specific agenda for today. I don't see any hands going up. Okay, then I think we can close public comment, period. Um, coordinating group meeting and the uh, four towns meeting that we that happened uh, uh, Thursday and Saturday, I believe. Um, so, uh, Andy, can you uh, recap the co coordinating group meeting, please? I'll do a little and I'll let Mandy take over because I think that she will also have some important comments to make as another member of the committee who is on the budget coordinating group. Uh, the principal uh, discussion began with the presentation of what is um, probably the earliest I have seen in all of my years in, in uh, town finance uh, work of a projection for revenue and expenditures for uh, the next year. So it's an early early start to the conversation, but uh, one that I think was aimed towards uh, trying to uh, have that conversation take place before the Four Towns meeting so that we were grounded on our thinking um, as uh, the Amherst members of the uh, who are going to be present as to what uh, we understood of the town budget so that when we heard about the school budget we could make that fit together and uh, in the um, presentation the materials that were presented to you um, and I hope you had a chance to look at it there is a copy of that preliminary um, 
budget presentation. And I noticed that both Melissa and Paul are here to answer any questions about it since they were the ones who presented it to BCG. Um, I, I thought that we had a, a honest and um, you know open discussion about the uh, projections and where they might go. We understood without having had a presentation from the uh, 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 from the schools because that didn't happen until then Saturday. Uh, so we, uh, but we were able to talk about it and uh, able to uh, sort of reflect on the extreme pressure that is on the budget because we're not in. Uh, I think that when you look at the, um, if you've looked at it, you realize that our budget um, remains as challenging as it does every year, um, but more so because of a couple of factors that were in there. One is um, health insurance um, appears to be going at a um, up at a larger rate than uh, had been anticipated and that uh, that posed a challenge. And I think that was similarly reported during the Four Towns meeting from the school, regional school perspective, uh, presenting essentially the same information. But of course, we're not going to know the real rates until January. So even when we have the uh, financial indicators presentation at, uh, to the council, uh, at that point, it'll still be before that information is available. And the other thing that we know about is that Last year, we could make a 4% uh, um, presentation in the midst of the process, uh, it was February or March, uh, because we knew that uh, we had an anomalous year uh, for retirement and that retirement in, uh, is not going to be as favorable this year because that anomaly is not likely to occur, occur again. And uh, there was also the possibility that it actually could be greater because it is a variable factor depending upon uh, the population of who's working for the town at the time that they do the census and the date they do the census. And uh, our, uh, I think we had vacancy at the time that, as well as the date, and, um, and the two of them fell together in a way that was extremely favorable to Amherst. But um, uh, that means that there could be adjustments that occur in the next year. If I've misstated that, I'm sure that uh, Melissa or Paul will jump all over me and. Uh, 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 correct what I just said. But I think that was the summary that I would have of it, uh, Mandy. Um, yeah. Um, there, I, I would say for those who are somewhat unfamiliar with Budget Coordinating Group, for the last number of years since the charter was instituted, it's had representatives from the Amherst School Committee, the library, and the council on it, as well as town staff. Um, and this year at the meeting last week, they added a regional representative. So there was a, a, school, a regional school committee member that was there specifically to represent the region. Um, that was Tillman. Um, I don't know Tillman's last name, but um, um, it was Tillman. And I think he is from Shootsbury, I believe, um, but maybe it's Leverett. Um, Andy can correct me probably better. It's Till Tillman Wolf. Wolf, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say one of the more interesting parts of the budget coordinating group meeting on Thursday that I thought was Austin from the library brought up, um, you know, sort of a um, how we do budgeting and how we present budgeting to the public. And so then there was a... a a somewhat involved conversation as to how do we communicate to the public the needs of all town sectors. Um, the school committee's 
with how they do their budgeting seem to do that pretty well. Um, but the town and the library have, and this is not, you know, saying one way is better than the other, but the town and the library have generally thought of trying to figure out how to fit their needs into the budget numbers presented um, instead of saying, here are our needs and here's what we need to cut to get to the budget presented. And we had a, a fairly involved conversation about um, how to best communicate to the public that all four entities of the town or sectors of the town are experiencing the hardships that the public is much more aware of in particularly the region, but the elementary school. Um, I think that's a conversation that needs to continue and probably does need to continue at the council too. And I guess there was one other aspect to that, uh, as I recall, Kimandi, is that uh, there was also this uh, discussion that took place a little bit about how we came about to the policy that really predates the council. Um, it has been around for a long time, but we, the council has chosen to adhere to it in its uh, uh, financial um, indi uh, indicators in each year, um, and that is that there be an equal percentage increase to the major sectors of municipal departments, library, regional schools, and elementary schools, and that um, we treat so that each gets a percentage, and that, of course, as we know, doesn't mean that each department with, or section within a budget is then treated equally. That's a determination by that sector um, in its own budgeting process. And so there was a discussion of that, um, how we got there, why we got there, and a little bit of you know philosophical debate on the subject. Okay. Um, I had, I, you know, just looking at the budget, um, I, it scares me when, when I look at FY 27, 28, and 29, um, our, you know, our, I mean, we always, early in the process, we always have a, a deficit in the current year or the next year. So that doesn't bother me so much, but um, I see the deficit keeps, you know, increasing as we go forward in time. And in particular, our, our capital and uh, debt ex or our capital and our, and our uh, well, mostly of the capital goes up a lot. Capital spending goes up a lot. Is that, uh, Paul or, or Melissa, is that what we anticipate? We're going to have to, you know, sort of figure out how to get around that um, in other parts of the budget or? So it's not. Go ahead. I don't know how to how to say it, but the reason you see the spike is the um, outside the outside two and a half, the debt exclusion for the school that that's, you know, over a million dollars in future years. And so right. that um, is not part of our normal operating capital. It was voted outside of that. And so that's why it looks bigger in those years. And that um, increase in that capital spending is offset by additional taxes in those years for the debt exclusion. Okay. Okay. That makes, makes me a little bit happier, <laughs> but I still see uh, the deficits increasing as, and um, again, I know that we close them. We, you know, we, we, we always manage to it's a little scary to look that our deficits keep going up. <laughs> um, um, I don't know, Kathy. Did you have some comments? I uh, yeah, and it, it some of it's a question to make sure I understand what I'm reading. Um, when I'm looking at the town projection on expenses, and then um, the two and a half, those include the health insurance increase. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, they do and they don't health insurance is not called out as a separate line in this budget um, projection. So it's part of, it's supposed to be inclusive of the two and a half. So as that goes up faster than two and a half, other, other lines compensate for that. 
No, and thanks, Melissa, because that's how I'm looking at it. So mm -hmm. if it's two and a half and one part of it is going up by 13 percent, if you flip that around on what's what the pressure is on salaries, on operating budgets, especially if we put in the contractual uh, obligations of step increases or other wage increases, um, two and a half is a stranglehold, I would say, on across the board, you know, irrespective of which department we're looking at. So I just wanted to make sure that was was accurate. And the um, there's the assumption Bob focused on capital and you've just basically held the 10 and a half percent all the way through. Um, yeah, it, that's what, what I saw. So the school, it comes in with an offsetting amount, but that's that's a decision. I, I just want to because I'm going to raise this later. That's a decision we're making that doesn't require to go back and negotiate an, a union contract at all. We we can, we can. It's we a can, it's a policy decision that we're forecasting for. Yep. Yeah, it's a policy decision. And then the other one, OPEB. I realize we've had a way of funding OPEB, um, but uh, we're we're a bit unusual compared to other towns on how much we do. So to me, that is also a policy decision. I mean, but but yes, I realize it has other consequences. I just want to focus on a couple items that aren't completely driven by we employ this many people, they're getting this wage increase and they have these health insurance. So mm -hmm. so I think that line it's it's I realize it's a different kind of policy decision, but it's a policy decision. Um so I, I think I'll I'll stop there because I was doing some what ifs went in relationship to what With we heard. Right now. So. Um, so I'll stop. Those were questions. So I just wanted to make sure I was reading it correctly. Bernie has his hand up, Bob. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm, I'm just telling the committee that and the audience that um, my internet connection is a little squishy right now. So people are freezing up. So um, Bear with me if, if I freeze up. Uh, Bernie? Thanks, Bob. Um, I, I really do appreciate the, uh, the, the projection. And, and uh, Melissa, thank you for your, your clarifications. Um, I, I'd just like to remind everyone who's um, either viewing this now or viewing this later that uh, Prop 2.5 was designed to starve the beast. Um, you know, systematically force governments to reduce spending because two and a half didn't bear anything of any resemblance to any economic principle. Um, and we've been able to dodge that by very, we being those of us involved in municipal government since 1983, um, we've been able to dodge that by increased state aid and careful budgeting and you know, knowing what our bottom lines are and trying to get things to fit. So I, I just like to, people to, to, to keep that in mind. There's no magic here. Uh, this is, you know, another one of those arbitrary decisions that sounded real good when it was made. Um, in channeling Bill Maher, I'd like to propose a new rule. Uh, the new rule being you can't say your budget's been cut unless you're actually getting less money than you got in the previous fiscal year. Uh, because <laughs> everybody... <laughs> Uh, the, the the kind of uh, um, cuts and debates and the like happen uh, everywhere and on the municipal side and the library side probably as well. They happen because of managers and uh, uh, they're not open. The debates aren't open to the public. We don't have a procession of department heads coming through and saying, oh, we're going to, you know, fail if we don't get this. Um, so I just like to have that, keep that, everybody keep that in mind. Your budget has not been cut unless you're getting less money than you got in the previous fiscal year. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Bernie. Like Kathy, did you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted, um, Bernie said two and a half was designed to starve the beast. Um, I want to bring up something else that we don't put into the equation and whether it was designed to or not, the charter school formula as far as I can see, is designed to undermine every public school in the state. And just um, if you think of our budget, I looked at the projected for FY25. They're not out yet for 26. It's taking 1.6 million from our elementary school and 
1.6 million, 1.63 from the region. So 3.2 million is not coming to us. And if you do statewide, it's a billion dollars that's being pulled out. So you're you're seeing you're seeing an impact where the state did not increase the amount of money they were going to spend on schools when the charter came in. So us sending 22, 23,000 off for every ch child. And that's 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 not that many kids. Um, you know, it's 150 kids total. So it's sending out. So it's it's another thing that I don't think the charter folks who wanted charters would have said it's designed to undermine public schools, but the impact of it is doing it in in school after school. Um, so I, I realize that's outside of our control, but it is not outside the legislature's control. And it's, it's a billion dollars uh, that wasn't put back into the rest of the school system that's moving out, um, that's essentially funding other schools. So I just wanna, when we're looking at this, that's something that's been happening for a decade that we see particularly in the school budgets and the schools are unusual for that. We don't have the same kind of state policy decision directly affecting other parts of our budget. And it hit, it hits all of us because the schools don't have that state support anymore. So I will stop there, but it's a biggie. Yeah. Real quick, I disagree with Kathy on one thing. Uh, I, I think the charter school reimbursement formula was is designed to damage public schools and to drain money off um, from public schools to private schools for the, very, benefit of, very polite. for the benefit of <laughs> for the benefit of some very uh, privileged people. Um, and that seems to be what the economics of it are. Uh, it also doesn't take into account the incremental costs of uh, of educating a student. Um, it, it takes a it takes a chunk of money out. Uh, it's an average that, not the increment. Uh, so it's it's doubly unfair. So. Bob, are you frozen? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> Bernie was frozen. I, I was waiting for him to finish. Go ahead, Andy. Um, I was just going to point out a, uh, one or two things. One is that uh, on charter schools, that uh, we should recognize that uh, the way the charter school funding is um, happens is that it is a charge. Uh, that appears on our cherry sheets on the offset side, because if you when you look at a cherry sheet, it has two pages. The first page is the revenue, and then the offsets, and uh, so that's where the um, it occurs. For the regional schools, they also have cherry sheets. It occurs for the region for for the seven twelve kids that go to. Um, charter schools and our residents of any of the towns that appears as a charge on the uh, region and on our cherry sheet for Amherst itself, those are the elementary school students. Uh, so if you're just looking for it, those numbers are um, easy to find and easy to see, but um, it is, it, but that's how it is calculated. Uh, we're certainly engaged in a number of different places to try and address this issue, um, but ultimately it's a legislative issue. And uh, I think uh, we're having a situation where our legislators understand and are sympathetic uh, there are other legislators, though, who get lots of pressure from charter schools or um, have different perspectives because of the districts that they serve. And uh, so I think it's going to be a, um, a tough uh, uh, thing to deal with on the um, in the legislature to see if we can really make progress on it. And the last thing I'll say is that I've been working on this on the municipal, on, on the MMA uh, fiscal policy committee, 
and I actually have a one-on-one -on -one meeting scheduled for Thursday with uh, the chief lobbyist of the MMA who works on fiscal policy issues um, on this subject. So uh, I'll be interested to see if there's anything that's reportable um, at a future meeting what she has to say about it or that we can project anything out of that. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. I struggle with the conversation that always happens in this committee and at the council regarding charter schools. Um, we, yes, should be advocating at the state level, but we should in no way be saying that our budget issues are a direct result of charter school and charter school only. That health insurance goes up 13%, whether we have an extra 3 million in the budget or 1 million in the budget or not, and we still only get 2.5% a year. It does not solve the budget issues, even if we solve the issues at the state. And to speak about charter schools and presumably the implication that our own residents who are choosing to send kids to charter schools are making a decision that is harming and should not be making their decision to harm our own because it harms the rest of the residents in town, I think is a bad implication. And it's really what I hear when I hear about charter schools are the problem, charter schools are the problem. What I, what I hear is how dare you send your kid to a charter school? One of the reasons the Commonwealth created charter schools was for exactly what happened in Amherst. We now have a Commonantes program and dual language program in order to better teach our kids languages because the charter school that is supposed to be innovating was doing it. And our district said, oh, look at how much demand there is for that. Maybe we should do it too. And all of our Commonantes kids have benefited from that demand and the need to teach language in elementary school and do it. The other thing I sound, seem frustrated and am frustrated about is, I Kathy knows this because I pulled all the charter school numbers for the last 12 years, I believe it was, and how many Amherst was sending from the state. I've been in this position for six years, and even before that at the region, all of the comments always focused on the Chinese Immersion Charter School. Yet six years ago and five years ago, it was the Performing Arts Charter School that was taking more kids or that was, that was receiving more Amherst kids than the Chinese Immersion Charter School. Yet all of the condemnation came down on the Chinese Immersion Charter School from the Regional School Committee. And it's hard to not see and listen to the conversation about charter schools when nearly the only charter school that is ever mentioned is a charter school that teaches an Asian language and has a large and in frankly, the highest percentage of non-white students in this area. And so I'd like us to when we talk about budgets, yes, advocate at the state level for charter funding changes because that will help us, but not put the blame of our problems with funding our budgets and making do with what we have at the banks of the families and the feet of the families that send their students to charter schools for a better education. Thank you, Councilor Haneke. Uh, Kathy? I'll just do a really quick response. Mandy, I think that pulls us way away from if we think these are great schools, and I'm not saying they're great schools, and the performing arts plays a particular role with kids that might behavioral issues. Um, they pull in a high proportion of them. The state should just be funding them. It's the issue is funding. Um, if we spent a regular $5,000 for school choice, to the charter schools. They would have to find money from other sources. It would be a huge savings to us. So, so if we need and value those schools, and I'm not saying we don't, um, you know, it 
just imagine if the common school, the Montessori school, they all we could drain another twenty thousand. I mean, we've we've got some private schools operating on public dollars. This is not saying any of those schools are not attracting families for good reasons. It's just it's literally saying the formula is set up to hurt public schools. There's no acknowledgement that when a child leaves, they don't take $22,000 in spending. So this is a fundamental flaw in the way they were set up. And the state legislators could set up a line called charter schools, and they could supplement the budget. There's not, because they're not district-based, they're not the same obligations that we carry with some of our kids, but they do have an open lottery, and they take kids who they may or may not be able to serve as extensively as we do in some categories, but you can just see what is happening. So I am not in any way saying that a family is not making a good choice for their child. I'm saying the state has made a very bad choice for the way we're funding them. And it's it, it's hurting. When Andy, when you said building a coalition on this, the number of towns that are being hit by this now is huge. Um, so yes, you can't go in just as one town, but multiple towns are being hit by this. When we're looking at all of our region, whether it's Northampton, South Hadley, but if you get into the Worcester and other areas, you're seeing it as well. So my only point was there is an outside force when Bernie said two and a half is capping us. I said, there is this other that is, it has made municipal budgets uh, very, very tough. Um, and it's happening in the same time period. So it's it's at the state level, I understand that, but it's, it is a, a really poor funding formula that, that we're living with. Bernie? Yeah, not to prolong the discussion that much further, but I didn't mention any particular charter school. I said charter schools, plural. Uh, and that was aimed at the funding formula. And I thought I made that very clear that it's unfair the way that public schools are tariffed for, for charter school tuition. I think Kathy's right. If the state really wanted to have um, a, a robust alternative school system, they should fund it. And that's not to say that I happen to be very fond of the performing arts charter school. I was at one point asked to be on their uh, board of directors and declined. Um, I have no problem with the Chinese language uh, immersion program. I have a problem with the way they're funded. I also have a problem with, you can point to a couple of charter schools that are performing some interesting work that are, are uh, have a particularly specific, almost unique character to them um, for the students of, of with certain interests and certain needs. And you can point to other charter schools that are simply a way of escaping, improving and funding public schools. So it's not a pure play. Um, but I, I, again, there's no um, <laughs> there's no intention of, of, of criticizing any student that goes to a charter school or a specific charter school. It's the formula and what's uh, what's behind some of the movement, not all of it. Well, I want to bring the discussion back to Amherst and the regional schools, um, because I think we have a, a real serious problem. And um, is there anything else, uh, Andy or, or, or Councillor Haneke, you wanted to mention about the BCG discussion? OK, so um, if we can move on to the four towns meeting discussion. Um, there was uh, I was encouraged in many ways. Um, by uh, Dr. Z's uh, presentation, um, she, um, I, I did include it in the, the uh, I sent it out to everyone. Uh, Athena, would you, did you get it in the packet? Okay. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's worth going through it. Um, I would like to, I can share my screen. Bob, if your internet is unstable, um, okay. it might it might be a burden on it. But I can okay. pull the document. If you could up. pull up that, that that presentation, I just want to focus on a couple of pages on that. Um, so 
because it, it's a long presentation and I don't want to repeat it. Um, but I think there's there's two uh, two pages in particular that I think are are would be helpful. If you could scroll down to the crucial process shifts, um, it's it's down quite a ways. Yeah, that's it. So um, the superintendent uh, basically said uh, was not a big fan of level services budgeting because uh, it just basically maintains the status quo um, and it doesn't really address um, students changing students' needs. Um, she wants to move this year to a line item budgeting process, which uh, we'll break it down, uh, but it doesn't really get to where she wants to get to. What she really wants to do is in the second set of bullets, uh, shift to a performance-based budgeting. So budgeting uh, to um, directly to measurable outcomes uh, such as student achievement, attendance rates, or graduation rates. So in other words, focus on the students and the budget should focus, should follow what the students' needs are. Um, and um, so I think uh, she wants to uh, shift to that and it's gonna take a year or two before she can get there. Um, the other thing that she brought up and it was there was a story in today's paper about it was um, she wanted to, um, she wants to close or move the, the students from the middle school to the high school. Um, and so the high school would then be basically the, a, the regional school, uh, grades seven through 12. And um, she wants to save money um, by doing that. She can reduce uh, spending by something on the order of $2.3 million. Um, and that won't quite get us there, but it helps a lot in terms of of um, where we wind up. So if you wanna, Athena, go down a little bit to the, the next slide with the scenarios and the surplus and deficit. And this is all the different uh, ideas she had about how to reduce staff. Um, this is it, yeah. So um, she presented six scenarios um, and the scenario one was a 6% base for FY25. In other, in other words, keeping the base that we, we um, agreed to fund last year um, with a 4% for FY26. Scenario two is, uh, is a 6% base, but only a 2.5% increase. Scenario three is a 4% base with a 4% increase. Scenario four is a 4% base with a 3% increase. Scenario five is a 4% base with a 2.5% increase. And scenario six is a 2.5 base um, with a 2.5 increase. Now we should say that scenario five is what you saw in Amherst's budget um, for FY26. We had a 4% base and a 2.5% increase. And you can see at the bottom uh, here, she has uh, put in this 2.373 million uh, that she can save with consolidation. And um, the, um, the net is that scenario one is the only, the region, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the expenditures of, and all the others are show an increasing uh, deficit um, as to the different scenarios. So um, Athena, I What I did on the spreadsheet was look at what the impact of Amherst's budget would be. Um, if you don't have it, if 
you cut out for just a moment, Bob. Did you want me to pull something else up? Yeah, could you? Oh, sorry. Um, I said to have a spreadsheet. Um, Got it. Could you pull that up, please? want to make make that a little bit larger so basically uh, the first uh three rows are what we had last year so we, our budget was 18.4 million we added 355k of arpa funds and the total our total expenses for fy 25 are 18.8 million now if you look at scenario one um if well actually if it's scenario five is what we've put in the budget uh, for this year uh, in the draft budget. So um, we basically have a 2.5% uh, $462,000 increase over what we spent in, what, what our budget was in FY25. So that would be that first B, uh, B uh, cell B1. Um, and so row seven shows the Amherst assessment for each of these scenarios. And then row eight shows what the increase is from our original FY25 budget. That would be the 4% budget that we had. So you can see in scenario one, we're, we're on the hook to put $1.1 million more. Um, and if you look at the last, the bottom, three lines, I just sort of arbitrarily put a 3.5 increase, a 3.0 increase, and a 2.5 increase. So 2.5 is what the um, what we saw in the uh, the budget uh, BCG presentation. So we're on the, we would be on the hook for almost $650,000 more um, under the scenario one. Um, so just so everybody understands um, what the imp imp implications are for the Amherst budget uh, for these uh, different scenarios uh, for the, the regional schools. Um, Councilor Haneke, you were there. Did you want to add something? Um, I, I just had a comment, not necessarily about the meeting itself, but that I found the inclusion of scenario six kind of odd um, because it's not really a scenario that any town, as far as I know, has been talking about remove, reducing the base below the 4% that had sort of been initially agreed upon before things kind of went haywire in April of last year. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I found that inclusion kind of odd. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's 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 not anyway. I don't think it's going to be considered. It's not realistic. So, uh, but it she did in, include it. So I thought I would just show people. You know, we could save a lot of money <laughs> if we if we adopted scenario six. But it's not going to help the schools. Um, Kathy, uh, Bob, I did a I was doing a a similar computation, but I looked at. What if we said the base actually went up by 6% and then we went, it's her scenario two. And I got that if we were at that, the increase would be, now I'm going to blank it. Where did I write my notes? I have it on a spreadsheet. So in the neighborhood of 364, I think it's the one you might have somewhere in here. So I started saying, what if we were there where we're saying, at 6% and then just a 2.5%, how might we fund it? with other um, thinking of where we might find the money. So um, I'm prepared to talk about that because some of it's controversial um, if you think we're there, but it was doing this, suppose we said, you know, the starting point and it's basically what is the starting point in FY25? And so we put this extra money that got us up by 6%. What if we said that's there? And we only go up by two and a half percent. Then I looked at what if we went up by three percent? You know, I was playing with how much money do we need from somewhere. So one of the things I just realized when I was looking at the BCG numbers is we we are projecting a deficit in FY26. Um, 
irrespective of all of this. So I didn't take account of that. Um, so I don't know whether um, now is the time. I looked at two particular places and I'll have a potential third that I'm prepared to talk about just to throw out ideas. Um, Cause this would have to go, if we wanted to do anything, it would have to go into guidelines. Um, so we wouldn't be saying exactly what to do, but it, it's looking at where in our budget with looking at the BCG numbers, where a number could be lower. Um, so let me know just if, if it makes sense to talk about it now. I, 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 I think it's good to talk about it, but I'd like to get to, to, to Councillor Haneke first and anybody okay. else who has questions or comments. Yeah, um, two things. The first is I do actually want to thank, um, I'm not sure I did, but thank the superintendent for thinking because those that two and a half million in savings or whatever that number is from this, this line, 2.3 millions, in savings by looking at it this way. And this is, we don't get into policy, but, um, and so the school committee, I have no idea what they're gonna do, but um, if they go with this and if they support it, she was trying to find a way to save millions of dollars without affecting the um, actual educational curriculum and offerings and things like that of the students. And I think that's, a, Yay, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so I wanted to men mention that. Um, as to Kathy's point, um, I'm not ready to talk about where we would take stuff or where we might find additional money because I think we really need to more talk about the concept that we were talking about in BCG about, and, and Andy brought up and I brought up about how do we distribute revenues across the four functional major sectors um, and how do we determine whose needs are greater? Um, because we obviously have this presentation about the region, but we don't have a presentation about the elementary school and what their needs might be. We don't have a presentation about the municipality and what their needs might be. And we don't have one from the library and what their needs might be. And so I guess I'm hesitant at this point to say, well, if we can find money, we send it all to the region. Um, you know, I think we need a conversation about and a serious conversation with more information about how are we divvying up that pie and where are the needs that are not being met now across all four areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy? Yeah. <clears throat> I guess there are a couple things. One is that uh, I too was very, uh, um, pleased with the superintendent's presentation. For years, we have been saying in the finance committee that beginning every time with a level services budget is not uh, a good business principle and not uh, equivalent to what other segments of the uh, town budget, um, the, the, the expenditure sides of the town budget are doing and um we just uh were blown off year after year as saying oh it's a common thing for schools to do it this way and uh you know what we were looking for was somebody who would think outside of that box and i really appreciate that dr c is doing that and um so i you know i think that uh we owe her a big thank you for coming in and taking a different view and putting forward a different view. Uh, the other thing though, um, is that we need to remember that the uh, initial presentation that was made at the budget coordinating group for FY26 revenues and expenses, as noted, is extremely early in the process. Um, and uh, uh, it's not unusual that um, there was, when it's presented at the financial trends meeting, which is usually a little bit later, um, but not that much later, it's still, we lack a lot of information because we really don't know um, where a number, a lot of those numbers are going to come from, and it's a best guess. Uh, and so what happens uh, 
each year is is that as there is shifting uh because uh, a lot of those numbers um, are done historically on a very conservative basis that some of that deficit that bob was talking about earlier for the current year and future year tends to close over time just because when real numbers come in they um it, it takes care of some of it, not all of it, but at least it moves us in a direction. Uh, and that's how the process has worked. So, um, and I say that because uh, this is a helpful conversation to have, to get our heads around what it is that we're gonna have to do, but this is very preliminary. This is an awfully early stage to be having um, an actual discussion where we say, oh, we can't accept this, or this is the only thing we can accept. I don't I don't think it's fair to anyone to do that. Thanks, Andy. Um, the, I just should point out that the reason I won was that there was some support for that scenario among the four towns expressed support for that. So um, we may find ourselves in to what we found ourselves in in June or May, where uh, the, th the three towns decide, well, we're going to go with a uh, 6% base and 4% increase at that point. So um, I, I do think that um, be thinking about what we're going to do if that comes up, have to react to react in real time to that. Um, and thinking, but again, we're talking about almost six hundred fifty thousand dollars in order to is what we have proposed, basically in or for our FY twenty six budget. Um, We do need to remember um, that that discussion that was taking place at the four towns meeting was not done with breakouts of uh, based upon breakouts entirely. That uh, most of the groups, as we did, did not actually take a position in the end. And one of the towns that did stay. Uh, a position when I uh, had a conversation with several people representing that town after there was it was clear that it was the speaker's view not the town's view that was being presented yeah I understand I understand that I'm just pointing out there was some support expressed in the room um, and that's how the the started last year <laughs> um so, you want to weigh in? I, I didn't hear you who you called on. Um, did you want to? Yeah, I didn't think he heard you. Yeah. Weigh in? Sorry. Yeah, you, it was a frozen moment. I didn't hear my name. Sorry, Bob. I hope you can hear me. Um, I, hear I, I didn't get to attend the meeting uh, on Saturday, but I really appreciated seeing the materials and, and hearing your briefing on it. It's, I, I feel like, and I haven't met our new superintendent yet, but I, I commend her courage, uh, her frankness um, at this point. Um, she's got to think about it. She's got to think like a turnaround uh, executive. Um, it, this is a turnaround situation, whether we call it that or not, because we have a, what looks like a, 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 just a not sustainable in the literal sense of so the, the school budget, when you look beyond a few years out, I know we've gotten along year to year, and I, I'm 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 an old man who went to public school here, and I put put my kids through public school here, so I've paid attention to it for some time. But you know, as many of you have said, we we can't really live within the three the two point five percent stricture, uh, although that's ostensibly the law. We, we can't afford to lose students and money to the charter schools, uh, although that's the law too. That's the dollars follow the customer. And 
our customers are choosing our competitor. Um, so I, I did have a question, and this isn't on the charter school side, but um, I saw in the presentation she gave that she she made the comment that um, we want to give our students the best, but you know, in looking frankly at things, can we can we at least afford to give them the basics? And I think I really commend her her uh, pra practicality in saying it that way. But as an Amherst person, it breaks my heart to think that we have to make that kind of a uh, a concession. So I was really excited by what I imagine she means when she talks about performance based budgeting. But I'm just trying to understand and, and square that with the you know best to basic comparison, I wondered if there was a discussion on Saturday or if there's been a discussion since on what is, you know, what what that performance based, what would be the basis or the, the metric, what would be, how, what would, what would performance based budgeting look like? To what extent would that change the situ, the, uh, the scenario beyond say next year? What was that something that was discussed or that anybody has some insight to? It there was a really brief discussion and questions. And since she's at, as she said, you know, I'm at a really beginning stage thinking about this and she was doing it at the individual student level, allowing them to pursue what they want to. But they, people asked, are you talking about MCAS scores? Are you talking about test scores? She said, not necessarily. I'm really talking about a whole system. That's how well are we doing for the kids? And I think that's the beginning of a big conversation with the regional school committee you know, not to mention with the teachers, you know, in terms of kind of everything's on the table. She talked about scheduling. Are we doing scheduling right? Are we losing time during the day? Um, what's the flow of kids look like? And, and you're thinking this is a person who's jumping into something um, with, uh, with it swirling around her. Um, so I just, you know, I, I think it was um, a breath of fresh air at the entire beginning of the conversation, you know, and even the simple thing like let's move them all to the high school that's not easy you know and and so the questions we're talking about moving the sixth grade into the middle school are they going to be there alone <laughs> you know i mean it's you know there's there's so many moving parts that without a lot of time um so you know my i went back i know mandy doesn't want to have a larger budget discussion now but i think we have to and i wasn't saying make a decision just about regional schools but i looked at places that are policy decisions, like the capital, we don't have to spend 10.5. So I said, what if it was 10.3 or 10.2? You know, what's the difference? We don't have to spend as much on OPEB. What if it was 100,000 less? What if, and then this is the one that everyone's going to gasp at. We have, I think, one program that so far has not been working well. It's called CRESS. And what if we went back and reevaluated the basic model and said for a while, their vacancies in the, as I understand it, froze a couple positions. So had two fewer people, what would that savings be and roll it up with benefits? So I was looking at within the general fund budget and others, and Mandy, just so you don't jump on me, I wasn't thinking it all goes to the region, <laughs> you know, but it was really like, these are areas where we could, if we took a hard look at it, be asking the manager to give us something back. Um, and and I was just saying, how much? How much is that one? How much is this one? And so I can get up to four hundred thousand dollars, you know, without you know slash and burn, um, which is certainly helpful. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking of every single budget. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about DPW or the library or any of our subs that have a lot of people. Two and a half is is. Um, with a 13% health insurance is is a nightmare um, because that's not salary increases, I think, are pushing up a good three or 4% a year, not counting benefits. So underneath it, it's not, if I do steps, you know, if I do steps, it's not that people got those increases. So this, we're, we're at a point of making extremely difficult decisions and Though Annie keeps saying it's very early guidelines, we're supposed to have guidelines by the end of this year, by the end of November, ideally, to talk about. And then Paul has to wrestle with all of this. So having some of this discussion, Bob, 
in October on where do we think, because we would have to not say do this with the general, you know, general staff, we would have to say, here's how you could do it with the general staff and not slash and burn our departments. Um, so we have a lot of one person departments. So I didn't go there. I went to where do I think if we change the model and I'm willing to have a larger discussion on press because I think maybe we made the wrong decision at the beginning and we could do some corrective moves. So I will stop there because I don't want to get into the numbers, but I was doing what Bob was doing, uh, what ifs, um, and here are pockets of money. And I could find it. And then the question is, Mandy doesn't want to spend it all on the regional school necessarily. You know, like elementary, um, for those who, who remember elementary, they had a bigger chunk of ESSER money in their budget, which avoided a hard discussion last May on elementary because they could come in. They're not going to have that this year. Um, so we that's a, another part of our school budget that we're going to have to tackle. Um, so I will stop there, but I did start thinking department-wide and deep and where where is there some opportunity to be more efficient as a town and to make difficult choices? Uh, Councilman Haneke? Yeah, um, I, I guess, uh, Kathy, um, yes to, to some of that, but um, I just don't want to focus on where would it all go, right? Um, because I think we need that conversation separate from, I think we need to separate the two. Yes, we need to have a conversation that relates to financial guidelines on where might we trick out a little bit more money or guide the manager in tricking out a little bit more money on the on that sheet and a conversation. I think right now, Cress is an opportune time to have that conversation with Cress because they've been in operation about two years now. So it's about that cycle where we should start evaluating that new department we created and seeing whether any policies need to be revisited around that. Um, but I, I do think we also need that conversation on is an equal split every year still again that's part of our financial guidelines still a guideline we want to stand by or do we want to be asking the library to present us with information so bcg can have a conversation and then finance can have a conversation and then you know the council can have a conversation the library to present us with information sort of on their needs and their budgetary needs in total, not trying to fit into any specific number and same with the municipality. What are the budgetary needs without trying to fit into any specific number with presentations maybe at BCG that has to meet more regularly to then come back to this committee to have conversation about that, to then go to the council for those financial guidelines in November. Um, Cause I think we need that, it's time to have that conversation too as whenever that policy was adopted, our town looks a lot different now. And we've had different things come in. We've had different governments come in. I think we should talk about that policy. I wanted to say one other thing that I took away or that concerned me regarding four towns, which is that at least in the numbers presented, the superintendent seemed to basically be throwing away any assessment method at all and saying the assessment method is going to be X percentage above last year, no matter what the 100% statutory would be or this or that. And they claimed that that was because whichever one they used, everyone hit the quote guardrail of whatever it was anyway. Well, I'm not actually sure that's true. Um, that everyone automatically hit say for scenario one, that 4% guardrail if you used a 6% base because based on some numbers I had from last year and obviously I don't have assessment 100% statutory numbers from this year. I'm just basing it off of spreadsheets I saw last year, Amherst would actually increase if you took the same total assessment in scenario one to all four towns, that 24 million, Amherst increase would actually be about a hundred and a um, hundred and some thousand dollars less than the 19.5 million. It would be 19.4 something. Um, Shootsbury's would be about the same and Pelham's and Leverett's would be a lot higher. Um, and so I don't, I, I think we as a town need to, again, have a conversation about where we stand on where the assessment should be, where the guardrails should be, if we're going to support guardrails and all. And I think we need to have that conversation a little more, a, a little earlier. 
um, because we just need to talk about how each town funds its assessment and whether we still support the state method or we support something that it seems like the superintendent might be going towards, which is a two and a half you know, across the board or a 4% across the board, which sort of sets those percentages at what they were last year. Um, that never relooks really at what those percentages are in a sense. And again, that goes back to our two and a half every year to all four sectors. But did we even set those percentages at a correct one if we go to that? Thank you. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, I um, was sorry I missed the Saturday morning meeting, but when I sort of found out about it late and two, I was pulling junk out of the Fort River. Uh, um, as part of my um, Fort River uh, uh, cleanup efforts. Uh, how Amherst comes up with an initial division of where the new money goes is um, sort of an anomaly. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that we need to necessarily abandon that, but I think we need to come behind it and say, this is where we start. There may be some flexibility to uh, uh, given certain exigencies, certain things that have happened. We may have to start off dividing the money that way, but, but we may have to come back and make make changes as, as the budget goes on to so make it a little bit more fluid. Uh, one of the things, small point, one of the things I noticed in the superintendent's uh, uh, presentation was a, a proposal to uh, uh, reduce the contribution of uh, insurance payments from 80% to 15%, uh, 75%. I don't know that it depends on how um, uh, the regional staff are technically town employees, but we have school uh, st uh, staff who may be town employees, and we can't do an arbitrary division of, um, have arbitrary different contribution rates for, for health uh, employee health insurance. So that's probably that little changes may well be off the table and someone can feel free to correct me on that. Um, I do think we need to go through uh, the, um, we need to take our look at Crest, uh, Crest we need to take, which I, I thought the model was flawed to begin with. Um, we need to take our look at that and how that's the spending on that is going and what we're getting for the money. That's uh, not that it's not a worthwhile idea. It's just maybe poorly implemented. Um, we need to take a look at where we have um, promises and proposals for new spending. And again, I sound like broken record. Uh, some of those are going to have to go off the table, take be taken off the table. Uh, whether we decide to give more resources to the regional school government um, or not, we're going to have to do that work to make sure we can balance the town's budget going forward. So thanks. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, Paul? So a couple things. One is, you know, yes, Bernie, the region employees are region. They, they have their own, um, they fund their own um, health insurance. Um, the reducing the percentage of the contrib contributions is a negotiable item with the collective bargaining units. Um, I guess from my perspective, one of the frustrating things with this is that we have known for many years or several years that this cliff was coming and um, we knew that the regional school budget was supported by one-time money um, and there was no plan of action by the school to, to address it. I commend, like you all have, the, the superintendent for coming in and sort of taking fresh eyes and sort of going at it um, in, a, in a pretty aggressive way. And I think she recognizes what the challenges are and she's trying to come up with anything that she has uh, to address it. So I commend her for that conversation. Um, you know, in terms of where we are, as Andy said, we're very early in the process. These are really early numbers. Um, it's we are, the next sort of step for us is the financial indicators presentation, which will be November 4th. We should have our free cash certified by then. We will know where what our financial situation is. We'll have FY24 closed out. We'll have updated numbers. Um, we'll have preliminary projections on some of the some of the items. So I think that November 4th date is a, is a key date. 
And I think November is going to be your month for the finance committee to build your financial guidelines, um, the budget guidelines that you're going to give to me, which hopefully you'll get done by uh, early December so we can start building our budget. So I think that's the time frame for the, having this conversation. And I think you've all identified it. The, the question is, with the revenue we have, do we follow the same pattern that we have in the past, which is divided up equally, or do we do you recommend that we divide it up in a different way? And you know, there's different needs, and sometimes you don't do it just across the board. That's been seemed to be perceived to be the fairest way to do it. Um, it will always seem be, but then there's different you know um, judgments as to who should have more of the funds. It's a it's a we we can't expand the pie. The pie is what it is. It's just a matter of how you divide it up. And that's that's where the guidance from the town council is key because you're the ones who will need to say here's how we want you to divide the pie up and that's that's the the mega decision that has to be made. So, uh, so I, I think this conversation is important to have. I, the school district will continue its work. We'll continue to work with the district, um, but you know, until we can cl close out FY24, get you the financial indicators. Um, and have, then I think expect November to be a pretty heavy conversation month. Paul, are we going to win fourth quarter results or the fourth quarter numbers? Uh, so we're finalizing those in order. The, the goal right now is to get free cash certified so we can make those decisions. Um, Holly is very close to finalizing okay. what that looks like. So I think there's one, she's working out one thing that hasn't been completely complete. Uh, finished yet so but i think she's very close to that athena did you want to i think it was councillor haneke that suggested um uh more frequent meetings of bcg and that was something that we had discussed potentially convening the town manager potentially convening bcg um during the development of the budget guidelines so that that conversation can happen among those departments Okay. Kathy? Uh, yeah, Paul, when we, Paul and Holly and Melissa, when we get the fourth quarter certified and free cash, could you also show us what our um, our reserve funds look like, the, var the various pieces just on the totals that we have in them, um, at, at whatever update we have? I know some of it We'll have a discussion on where to put the free cash if we have it, but I just like to know where we are on each of that. We have the capital fund. The, uh, everyone knows which funds we have, so I won't. I won't. Yeah, give, uh, we'll we'll get you those balances. I won't give them the wrong name, but <laughs> it's just helpful for me to have a framework on money. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Cool. Yes, yeah, so I think the, pl the, the plan is, you know, we do the financial indicators at that time. We also give you, we'll know, we, obviously, the balances, the what the current policy says for finance committee's policy in terms of uh, distributing the free cash funds into different reserve, into the different stabilization funds. Um, if we will have some financial orders for you to consider, that would all be done during that first week of November. That's our goal, at least. Um, I think subsequent to that, we also anticipate having bids in for the uh, Jones Library at that point in time. So probably not that first meeting, but the second meeting in November, we do an update on the on the capital projects and where we stand because we will know hopefully one way or the other where everything is at that point in time. Kathy? Not to complicate your life more, Paul, but um, the ARPA funds, um, I know you raised one question about the... Mm -hmm efficiency of the so, solar panels when they're put on canopies costs a lot more than solar panels when they're mm -hmm. put on roofs. Probably everybody knows that. But the question of, is that money going for it? And then um, I got requests from the school committee, what happened to the 500,000 that we were talking about for the middle school for the sixth grade? I think there is still time to allocate that. So some some just briefing on where we are with these, you know, they're, they're swirling numbers. Um, the middle school move of the sixth grade, some of it was painting, some of it was bathrooms. Uh, I, I don't know where there were pieces that led up to 500,000, but the acting superintendent had taken it off the table. And I believe 
the superintendent, the new superintendent at least wants to have a conversation. So I just, I just don't know where we are on what, and Bang Center was a huge thing, but it, it wasn't clear to me that it could all be done with contracts. So just some sense of, you know, I don't like one-time money, but I do like to spend it if we have it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I, can, I can assure you we will not lose the money. Um, <laughs> and I have had the conversation with the superintendent about what she has envisioned, although it seemed to be a little bit at odds with the idea of moving the middle school to the high school. I, was, I did not have that conversation <laughs> with her about how does the sixth grade move fit in with that. Um, you know, and we can only spend the money once. So if we're spending it on sixth grade, we can't spend it on solar canopies. It's one or the other. Um, that's the way that kind of works out. Thank you. I just, it was just helpful because it, well, yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is a question. Um, obviously we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> of discussion we have to make, but, uh, I think, uh, we're, we're off to a good start here. Um, Anyone else want any any comments on the four towns? Okay, um, so the next uh, uh, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the September third meeting minutes. Um, I read through them; they look fine to me. Do I have a motion to adopt those? I'm. I'll make a motion to adopt them. Okay, second. So moved. Okay, so uh, any discussion on this? Okay, um, what's... Bob, if you freeze, I can call the roll if you need me to. You just have to put your uh, hand. Vote on the motion then. Um, I vote aye. Uh, uh, Councilor Hanson. Aye. Okay, I think I froze up again. Okay. Okay. Uh, Andy? Aye. Kathy? Yes. Bernie? Support. Tom? He said support, but he was on mute. Okay. I do support. <laughs> and Matt? Support. Okay, great. So we've, um, we've uh, adopted those meetings. Um, so the last thing that we want to talk about, I want to talk about is uh, whether we can um, find another time to meet. Um, um, Councilor Walker suggested she could meet 3.30, after 3.30 on Tuesdays. That means we're going to go into, you know, 5.30, 6 before we're finished. I think November we're going to have some long meetings <laughs> um, in December probably, uh, maybe even October. Um, so uh, that's one one option. I have I haven't heard back from her. I asked her what day other days were were good for her, and I haven't heard back from her. So mm. I don't think we need to make a decision now. But um, I will work with uh, with Councilor Walker and maybe Athena. Maybe I, I'll ask you to send out a, a doodle poll and see what people can can do. Uh, but um, you know we we. At a minimum, if we could start at 3.30 rather than at 2, we could accommodate uh, Alicia. So uh, that's something to consider. I, I just I just like to point out that Athena didn't cringe when she was asked to schedule yet another meeting <laughs> or yet another group. Um, they didn't touch on that process in public policy school. So, but she does well anyway. Okay. Uh, Councilor Haneke? Um, I just want to point out that starting sometime around this month, many of the finance days also meet the same day as Community Resources Committee, which starts at 6.30 p.m. So at this point, I think I can move to 3.30, but I'm not going to be able to extend much over if you're expecting longer meetings, because I'm going to have a meeting, a committee meeting that starts at 6.30 on many of those nights if they can't be alternated, if we stay with Tuesday, but I know we're not um, possibly doing that, but. Okay, it's good to know. Kathy? So in, in the polling, I think for the reasons you said, Bob, three is a better start time. I don't think we wanna, um, it was staff 
has to stay beyond their closing time if we go past five, but at least we could schedule the discussion. And I think it's a, important to leave us that breathing room knowing CRC is doing. I am, for me, I am more, I'm not as tightly scripted for other days of the week because the school building committee only meets Friday mornings and Alyssa's, Alicia's on that. And we're only meeting once a month. And the one other one I was on is joint capital planning doesn't start till February. And I don't even know if I'll be on that again, but I think starting later in the day is just not a, then three is not a good idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm just trying to see if we can, we can find an, another time. So I'll, I'll work with uh, Alicia and see what, what times are available for her. Okay, is there any other comments or questions? Um, the only comment question I have is it would be useful for me if you would send out um, meeting schedule. I think I have them all correctly <laughs> in my calendar, but um, if, if are we meeting every two weeks? Should I do two weeks from today? That's the way I've got them in the calendar. Fino may know this. The next uh, meeting is the 15th and the finance committee meeting calendar is posted on the finance committee page. I can resend it to you, Kathy. Okay, if it's on the committee page, fine, but then does that mean the 15th, then the 29th? So if I look at it, I'll see them all, Athena? Um, the committee at this point is just meeting twice a month. So the, the 29th, uh, the 15th would be the last meeting in October, um, no meeting on the 29th. Okay. It's not every other week. It's, um, I think, yeah, first. We, we only have two two meetings scheduled per month because uh, of all the meetings in, um, Okay, that's that is in fact what I have in my calendar. So I've my calendar is accurate, and then we can make a decision if we need an additional meeting in November to get everything out. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. we just don't. We don't. I don't. I, I don't. Again, I don't know what time, what day of the week we're going to meet. You know, I think it depends on what we can work out. But don't switch to Thursdays because you'll hit Thanksgiving as one of the days. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm also <laughs> um, Andy and I are both on. TSO, which meets on Thursdays too. Yeah, so. so, so in any case. <laughs> okay, is there a motion to adjourn? I am so move. A second. Second. All right. Uh, we'll vote. Uh, I vote yes. Um, Councilor Haneke? Aye. Andy? Aye. Kathy? Yes. Bernie? I can't refuse. I, I agree. <laughs> Tom? I agree, too. Uh, Matt? Support. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank and, you. And uh, I'll be in touch with uh, with my uh, conversation with, with Alicia. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about Thank the you. internet.